Awesome today to welcome Carl Smesko to the podcast. Coach Smesko's resume sits among the best all time in NCAA Division I women's basketball as he enters his 22nd season on the sideline, including his 19th with Florida Gulf Coast. On pace to reach 600 career wins faster than legendary coaches such as Pat Summit and Tara Vandeveer, Smesko has won 554 games for an 82% winning percentage in his career, which ranks him third among active winningest Division I head coaches behind Gino Ariyama and Kim Mulkey. Furthermore, he passed Tara Vandeveer in 2017-18 to become the fifth winningest Division I head coach of all time. If that isn't enough, he's the 10th winningest active head coach across all divisions, as well as the 12th winningest coach all time. Coach, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's good to be here. Thank you. Coach, I got to say, you're a bit of an international man of mystery. Your success is ridiculous, and yet there is not enough known about you and your methods. Is that intentional? Well, I'm I'm introverted by nature, Um, so I like my time to myself. So I guess in some ways it's intentional or it just fits my personality. Well, for coaches that don't know a lot about you and uh, they're just learning about you for the first time, I know they're going to want to dive deeper. So we'll give them a taste here. And let's start with the three-point shooting. So five tra- five straight seasons with at least a 1,000 attempts. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive and a pretty good devotion to the three-point shot. Can you talk about that philosophy? Well, even 20 years ago, we've been pretty committed to shooting threes. Uh, we thought it was... Uh, you know, a great way for us to compete. Uh, so it's always been a, a big part of our offense. We always look to push the ball and work together to create good catch and shoot three opportunities. And uh, as time has gone on, we have uh, even relied on threes more if that was possible. I mean, 20 years ago, I think we were making like 10 a game uh, when I was a coach at IPFW. And now we get to 12, 13 a game made. Uh, and the way the game is trending is just more and more threes. Well, it's led to great success. And uh, coaches, if you go check out his bio on the Florida Gulf Coast, it lays out that three-point shooting that he just talked about, which is impressive over time. And uh, really, you were an early adopter in that philosophy. So where did that philosophy come from? Well, when I first got started as a head coach, was at Walsh University, uh, NAIA school in Ohio, uh, they're division two now. And I just, uh, believed in having more ball handlers on the floor. And I believed in having more shooting on the floor. So, you know, we played, uh, five guards and spread the floor and learned how to screen and cut and work together and penetrate and pitch out for threes. So, uh, you know, it just fit my way of thinking that uh, the more ball handlers and good decision makers you have, you're better, you're more likely to get higher return shots. And uh, being a new coach, I was willing to try it. And, uh, you know, my first year as a head coach at Walsh, we won a national championship. So uh, I became convinced at that point that it could be done. And, and, and could help you uh, achieve great results. And we've been sticking with it. Yeah, it's a pretty good support for the idea when you win the national championship, isn't it? <laughs> yes, for sure. So, uh, so many things to dive into. I've studied your team quite a bit because some people gave me insights about your team a long time ago. But uh, the one thing that I want to start with maybe is some of the isolation and some of the spacing that you create. And uh, you're definitely not afraid to put players in space and let them drive for drive to score or drive to create advantage for others. Can you talk about that? Well, we're definitely looking to create as much usable space as uh, possible. That's what, when we talk about, we talk about basketball dynamics and our first law of basketball dynamics is being able to create the most usable space. Uh, So we make a pass and then we make a cut yes to score or how do we create more space for the ball and uh, where can we pass the ball where that person will have the most space to utilize. Uh, We're trying to create as many closeouts as possible. And then we're also, the other advantage we're looking for is talent advantages. So 
if we see we have a talent advantage, we like to get that person into space and into a closeout, and we like it to occur naturally. So our players think and work together to create the situations, and and it's not something that has to come from the sideline where we have to call a play to make it happen. So saying that going into a game, they would know the players that have the advantage that you're trying to create for, and then organically within the flow, players would identify that. Is that, that's what you're saying? Well, our players definitely know uh, our own strengths, uh, what our players are good at. And then through scouting, we know certain defenders uh, that may not be as good at guarding the ball or guarding and closeouts. And if we can, through switching or screening and cutting, create, or just maybe in conversion, we always push it in conversion. If they're in matchups that aren't ideal for them, uh, we're looking to get the ball to a person with a good matchup and into space so we can start attacking. Now, we may not be able to score right away, but Usually we can, uh, I guess what everybody says now is the dominoes start falling or something. I hear, I hear that mentioned a lot now, but that's the concept is to get the defense scrambling and to keep them in a scrambling mode. So I love this. And I love that uh, you said your players know your own strengths. How do you teach that? Well, a lot of it's film work. Now we want to develop our players like we we'll, uh, we're known for shooting, but a lot of the players that have come to us haven't been great shooters when they got here. So we've spent a lot of time invested in their skill development. And I've seen a lot of players who just by the addition of becoming a good shooter has really changed the outcome of their career and how productive they've been able to be. And I've seen players with the addition of just a couple good offensive moves really change how productive and how efficient and how confident they become as basketball players. So there's that initial level of just developing a base level of skill that they can feel comfortable executing in game situations. And then it becomes recognizing the game situations uh, developed where they're able to utilize that skill. So we want every player to be a complete and a continuous player but not everybody's there right away. So some players may not be good at attacking closeouts and uh, during film work or during practice, we'll let them know that they're responsible for ball speed and stretching the floor or creating some, uh, you know, movement screening opportunities for us. So uh, if they see themselves catch it, uh, instead of maybe looking for the space to attack, they're looking for the teammate with the most space and getting that ball there as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, a lot of times people say that our offense is really complicated and really it's really simple, but when you add pace to movement, a lot of times it gives the illusion of complexity. And we're kind of looking to create that illusion of co complexity. And uh, it is designed to keep defenders occupied and paying attention to the wrong things. Where do I go from there, coach? Um, so many things. First of all, more than the ability to shoot, when you shoot a lot of threes, the psychology of shooting a lot of threes comes into play. Can you talk about how you build that mentality with your near players? Well, we, we do emphasize shot selection a great deal. Uh, and part of shot selection is we want you to be ready to shoot it every time you catch it. And if you have a good shot, we want you to take it. Uh, the first really good shot we get, we want to take. Now, uh, this is an ongoing process throughout a whole season. You know, you'll start getting situations where players are taking contested threes with 20 plus seconds on the shot clock. That's not what we're looking for. Now, that's no longer a high return shot. Uh, so, you know, through film, through practice, uh, we'll go over hey, how many shots really weren't the ones that we were looking for? And we'll just go through the film session and eventually uh, there's a shared understanding of what's an FGCU shot and how are we going to be able to create that? And the players who are best able to create those shots and follow a game plan are the ones who uh, usually have the most success in our program.
Yeah, it's great stuff. And then the illusion of complexity, I love that wording. And uh, having watched you guys, I can tell what the end goal is, is to get players in space and attack. But the way that you get there is constantly different. And I'm imagining that's what you mean by that is none of it looks scripted, but there is a plan. Yeah, we have some script, uh, you know, quick hitters, some actions. We have some communication calls to to get certain types of screens to be set or if we're looking for certain slips. Uh, but I feel better when we can play without making any calls. Uh, usually, uh, when, the more I have to take over from the sideline to make calls, it's usually in relation to our players being inactive and you know staring at the ball rather than creating these scoring opportunities and we'll just call something essentially to get us moving and get the ball moving. Um, so, you know, the, the illusion is having enough variability in your movement um, that you're not totally predictable, but really you're creating the same things over and over. Like somebody's catching the ball in a closeout situation in a space and reading that space. And then when we attack, we're cutting on penetration. So you have to decide whether you're going to help or guard our cutter. Uh, and then hopefully we're able to make the right decision after we attack. So those, those are the things we, we try to get us, ourselves to think faster, to act quicker, and then to make the right decision over and over. So that's what we, you know, emphasize in practice and film is really, our pace and our decision-making. Uh, without necessarily giving the exact calls, but when you mean a communication call, you're calling something like down to alert your players that they should be setting more down screens or something obviously like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah, we'll, we'll call something out that are, it usually involves a three-player action. It could be a two-player action. And it's a three-player action. Usually you get us moving and give us maybe a first look at a screen uh, you know, we'll have a misdirection cut and then we'll screen behind the misdirection. And if we read it correctly, hopefully we can get a shot off that first action. But if not, at least we've started moving and um, forcing the defense to respond to that movement. And a lot of times when you're moving, you know, they'll lose sight of either the ball or their man and, and more situations of advantage basketball are created. So the other thing that builds all this is your ideas on uh, horizontal and vertical spacing, where, where your players, you're using the whole half court to space. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we are. We're, we're trying to create maximum space starting in transition. Uh, and then, you know, we say something that's, uh, you know, maybe a little bit silly, but we always say the space is the space. So we're looking to attack uh, whatever space that we can create. Um, and then, uh, throughout a possession, we're always trying to, uh, re-space out, get the width covered, stretch again, because inevitably, you know, people move toward the ball and there's less room to work on catches. So we're spacing the ball and throughout a possession, we're creating space and everything we're doing. And we'll use the whole half court in that. Now, when I say, we don't have any traditional spacing. Like when, when you think of, uh, you know, some of the first coaching clinics I went to were Bob Knight's. And if you think about that 15, 18 space, be put spacing between people, uh, you know, we do a lot of the screening movements that Bob Knight taught and, and reads and things of that nature, but we, we never really did the spacing part of it. We violate the spacing between people all the time. We, are more in the thinking of the spacing for the ball. So we'll have three people come together. We'll have four people come together, uh, but we'll break out and then create spacing again. And then we'll work together to screen and violate spacing again. And if we read defense, hopefully we've created some confusion for the defense and put uh, defense in a help and recovery mode. 
I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I was thinking that exact thing and preparing for this about the 12 to 15 or 12, 15 to 18 feet spacing that a lot of coaches now are understanding that that's just a cliche. And really, we want more space than that. And you guys show that. The other thing you said is conver- I call them convergences uh, where multiple players come to a spot and then there's possibilities within that. Is that how it's taught that players have there's say one player is a designated first cutter. They make the first decision or is it actually completely unscripted when you bring this, these players together in a convergence? Well, it's actually both. Okay. Uh, it can be scripted if they call out a certain uh, action and then the first person isn't really reading defense They're They're cutting a score, but it's not necessarily a read. And then the next two people will work together and, and read defense and cr- try to create a scoring opportunity. Or it can just be organic and naturally flow into a three-player action and they're reading the very first part of it. Um, and then working together, you know, based on what that first player does, kind of uh, creates what is possible for the next two people to work together with. So... Uh, it, it's really both things depending on the situation. Well, and it, it also occupies help and that leads to a lot of drive to scores from your players as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. And that, that's part of the design. We want it to be able to create some scoring opportunities for sure uh, for the people who are working together, because if it never did that, I doubt we would cut as hard or, or, you know, look to screen as well or read defense as well if they weren't really involved in getting some scoring opportunities. But when that's not working for a score, hopefully it's at least working to occupy defenders so that, you know, the other two or if it's, you know, one person on a wing, you know, they have an opportunity to attack while that action is taking place. So I'm curious with this philosophy then, which, you know, is a common question I get asked is about how to attack sagging or pack line type defenses. And it would seem counterintuitive that they would play that against a roster that shoots three, but you still play against a lot of that type of defense. So what are your methods to be able to create space to drive versus that? Well, I think you you have to use uh, the gap help against them. Um, Whether, uh, you're cutting to create, you know, the double or triple gap or, you know, however somebody uh, refers to that, where you're really extending that gap, where it's really hard for one person to play the gap and help on the ball. So you're kind of a, a messing uh, with that gap help. The other thing is if you can look maybe to, you know, cap people in uh when somebody's too far into a gap and you can kind of creatively come up and set a, you know, a a screen from the side or seal them in where they didn't see it was coming. Uh, I think those are some of the things that can really uh, hurt some of the gap defense. Um, But, you know, if you're, if you're not moving the ball, and you're holding it too much, I think those defenses can be really effective. I think you really need to have really good movement. A lot of times when we see that, we'll just start with, you know, the first pass, we'll just cut really hard, get some circulation in our offense, and then we'll look to start capping some screens and setting some flare screens of that nature and uh, lengthening some gaps after we get the defense moving a little bit. So, I think if you just let them sit in their gap and watch the ball the entire time, I think they're an advantage. I think if you can get them moving first and then look to, to we call it capping, it's just a screen, uh, screen them in. I think you have an opportunity to get some open shots. Uh, that's, that's great insight. And uh, an old uh, quote of yours that I found was the thing we talk to our players about is to stay wide, wait and watch what develops is one of the hardest parts of teaching new players in your program, the concept of waiting? Well, it definitely is. Uh, The other thing is staring. Like, you know, a lot of times, especially when teams are sagging because it's easy to move the ball, uh, you just kind of stand there and really that advantage just to the defense because the pass is just an idle pass. It didn't create a closeout. It really didn't create any advantage, uh, in the past, 
we want to have some movement where those each pass we make has the possibility to create offense and attack into space. Uh, so having the patience when you're away from the ball and you're holding the width, we don't want the player leaving the width just because they want to get closer to the ball. You're, you're, you're doing something really good for us. If you're occupying your defender and they're out of the lane, um, and you can just have the patience for the ball to be moved a couple times, you'll be in a good situation instead of just getting closer to the ball because you feel like you just have to touch it again, you know, quickly, uh, having a little bit of patience. And we, we try to emphasize that and show them, Hey, look, this time you had a lot of patience. And when we got you the ball, you had a closeout, you're able to do something with it. And you're able to create a scoring opportunity as opposed to, when you just ran up to the ball, your teammate couldn't score. And now when you, if you get the pass, you don't have any advantage when you have it. So teaching that patience uh, can be difficult. Um, I think emphasizing that you want that width covered all the time helps develop that patience. Um, if you really emphasize that uh, the width is more important than just being the next pass. And I was going to say, like a lot of traditional, uh, if you go back 20, 25 years, traditional four out, five outs used to be that if you leave a space, someone fills the space. And that applies to your offense. But I'm what I'm curious about are what are your cues for the player to actually fill the space? Because they don't want to fill it necessarily right away. Oh, you, you need to be able to read whether the person who caught the ball is attacking that space. Um, so, you know, for us to fill it, it would be a couple of things. One, if we knew our teammates and it was somebody who wasn't necessarily an attacker, it's somebody who's supposed to just increase ball speed for us, uh, which is just the speed at which we pass it. Uh, they might move into, you know, the, what we call the alley or the sweet spot, which we call the top of the key uh, to, to create maximum space for when they have a catch. Uh, or if we see a, a player is, obviously not attacking and they need some help. They didn't have any advantage when they caught it. They didn't have a closeout. They don't have a talent advantage. Then we might move towards the ball and, and give it an easy release and start getting an offense on that next pass. So uh, it, it sounds more complicated than it is. It's just knowing your teammates strengths and, and trying to put yourself in good situations so that when you catch the ball, you have space, to work. So uh, back to the convergence concept, um, do you designate the number of players that convert into a spot or into a to violate space? Or is that something that happens again more naturally? Well, again, it's both. If it's a both. play call, if it's a play call, then we're, we're dictating three players are going to get together. The first player is going to low cut the screen. The second player is going to come off a uh, down screen or a cap that would be us calling it out uh, a lot of times just within our normal offense you know a player might make a cut to the rim and they're going to go out uh, to a three-player side and anything could happen at that point you know it could be a double back screen it could be what we call a trap screen which is you know one down screen and one back screen close to each other so the cutter has optionality whether they want to cut low or high off the screen um but none of that is you know dictated by what i told them to do it just kind of developed by uh the random movements of the players kind of just playing within the concepts that we have so the question becomes then how do you develop this in practice is it, is it a lot of you know offense versus defense game-based play to be able to learn these reads and decisions? Yeah, we, I mean, I know there's a, a lot of people that don't like the five on O, but we do do a lot of five on O at the beginning. Uh, we'll start somebody out of bounds who's not even facing uh, the action. And then we'll say go, and then they're going to turn around and they're going to figure out how to get into the action, uh, kind of simulating that they just made a cut. And now where's the best place to, how quickly can you recognize the best place to go? How quickly can you communicate with a teammate and execute an action that makes sense within our offense? Um, so, 
you know, we'll teach it like that. And then obviously you have to, you can, that can only take you so far. You have to get it where you can with 10 people on the court, be able to pass it, move, work together to create the spacing, uh, create screening situations to create advantages. Uh, you know, know, know your own personnel, your teammates for, and who's a good person to ball screen for, you know, where are we going to call out when we ball screen? What are the concepts for us when we ball screen? Uh, they're switching screens. What are we looking for now? Have we communicated that with each other? What are they switching one through four, one through five? Do we know what to do in this situation? And especially when you're a good offensive team, you're likely to see, you know, a lot of different things and sometimes things that, teams really only throw at you. So you didn't get a chance really to see it on film against somebody else. So you have to be prepared for however a team might switch up defenses and change. And our players need to be able to communicate and be able to execute actions that would be successful against whatever defense is thrown at them. Well, I loved your explanation because to me, five on O is what brings freedom for players is freedom comes from structure and understanding. So the five on O helps them build that and understand that. But as you just said, you can't stay there. You have to evolve it. So I loved your explanation of that. The other thing I'm curious about is when I looked at some of the, you know, past seasons and stats, I mean, you seem to have a pretty balanced team in terms of attempts and shooting, but you have had stars. So I'm curious how you incorporate the stars in terms of this philosophy. And then it does seem like sometimes the stars are allowed to have the ball stick a little bit longer. Is that true? Uh, that is true. Um, <laughs> Which is a good thing. Yeah, definitely. When you have somebody who's a special talent, um, you know, for them to hold the ball an extra second to see if space is created. Uh, if you think of it, maybe they we've created a mismatch for them and we've got the ball to them at the top of the key or wherever it is. And if they hold on to the ball for just one second, as somebody cuts, the space opens up behind the cut. Well, if they move the ball right away, we've missed our really good matchup with space um, and our biggest advantage. So uh, knowing, you know, our players know that we have when we have a, a special talent and we understand that they may hold the ball a little longer to see if something develops um, at the same time you know, we want it to be, you're holding the ball to see if something develops. We don't want you just holding the ball for the sake of holding the ball and, and having our offense have to reset all the time. So hopefully we work together. We created space for you to attack, you attack. And then when you attack, we're going to be moving and working together to give you options in case your attack wasn't successful in creating an advantage. Uh, you know, we don't just want to shoot heavily contested layups are our, our shots around the rim. We want to be with an advantage of some sort. And then our shots at the three point line, we want to be with the space and catch and shoot variety. Uh, and obviously teams don't want to give up those shots. So you have to really work to create those shots and have, you know, we typically shoot it pretty fast. So it might be weird to say you have to have the patience, but you really do have to have the patience um, to create the types of shots that you really want. And if it happens with five seconds on the shot clock, that's fine. If it happens in the first five seconds of the shot clock, that's fine. And uh, the better we are at moving and working together, the more often it happens earlier in the shot clock. Yeah, fun stuff. Players must enjoy playing this way. And uh, given the specific nature of this offensive system, and you, you talked about this briefly, th there's obviously a big emphasis on player development. So I'm curious, what that looks like within your practices, within your program? Well, I mean, there's levels to it. I mean, when we do our summer workouts, it's all skill development work in terms of it's shooting work, it's offensive moves, and we don't really get much past that. And then in the fall, we'll incorporate some reading of screens and setting some screens and learning how to cut and slip screens uh, we'll still be working on our shooting, our passing, and our offensive moves. Uh, so, you know, the, the skill development is something that if 
we make, you know, we have five players on the floor and if we can make each of those players be able to make one more three out of 25 attempts, that's a very statistically significant improvement. I mean, if you go from a 30, a 28% three point shooter to a 32% three point shooter, it's a big difference. If you go from 32 to 36, that's a, a, you know, we say that's from going from average to good in our program. And if you go from 36 to 40, that's going from good to excellent. And we try to get our players to understand that really that's only one more make out of 25. Some of this can be shot selection. The other is, can we get you to shoot it two inches straighter every time on average? You know, can you shoot two inches straighter? Can you get more consistent with your release and your arc? Uh, can we shoot it deeper in the basket? Reduce our short misses. Um, but all these things, you know, you develop a shot bake, your shot bake will probably increase your assist to turnover ratio. You know, the more you can attack it, close out, get to the paint under control and make a good decision with it. So it goes from the basic skills, but it's got to get to the point of decision making. So then by the time we get into our real practices, most of our drills involve some sort of decision uh, and making the right read, even on a penetration. This time we stopped you. Can you flip your hips and can you find the open person? And, you know, next time we didn't stop you, did you pass it or did you, you know, finish a shot? So for us, it's a, you know, get them comfortable in their basic skills, being able to develop you know, proper passing, offensive move, shooting, and then get to the point where they can read defense and make decisions and do it quickly at a, at a game speed. And then your offense is probably going to be pretty good no matter what you run. Absolutely. Uh, it's great stuff, great insights. And obviously you, you must be a shooting coach to a certain extent because of the mentality of your players. And then obviously you talked about that, just one more make and it changes things for certain players. So what are maybe some of the steps you go through when you're working with a player for with, with their shot, isolated skills training for shooting? Yeah, we, uh, we do emphasize shooting a lot. We, we try to keep it as simple as possible. I mean, we, we talk about the release, you know, if we can get, you know, the hand at the target, right. Down, if we can get the ball moving on the target line in a straight line, we've got a chance to shoot the ball straight. If you can shoot it straight, it's going to be the fattest part of the target. So you're going to have the most room and the most air to work with. Uh, so we want to see at the end of the release, the hand, we like both hands within the target. We like the fingers pointing straight at the rim. So we try to make shots as simple as possible. Um, you know, we don't want a lot of extra movement. We don't want the ball away from your body while you're trying to do it. We want to, we want you to be in a position to be as strong as possible when you're going to shoot the ball. And we want to have the shot as simple as possible so you can repeat it. And, uh, you know, we emphasize the release rather than the result. Everything that you're going to do to make the shot happens right at your body. So if you can get the ball out of your hand the way you want it and give every ball an opportunity to go in, then you got a chance to, as we say, make one more out of 25. And are you married to a specific footwork or is that situational specific or player specific? Uh, I'm not married to, you know, anything. I, we don't spend a ton of time with uh, where the toes are pointing or, anything like that. We, we spent a lot more time at the end where the fingers are. Uh, did we get the ball going in a straight line? Are we making sure that we're not fighting our body to keep the ball going straight? We want to make the, you know, the least amount of effort for the ball to get there, the most relaxed we can be. And can we uh, get as much science working in a straight line to the target as we can? I love that. That's such an important part that I wish I learned younger is just the fact that you should, shouldn't feel any tension when you shoot. It should be effortless. And sometimes when we force players to do certain things when they shoot, that takes them out of that effortlessness, doesn't it? 
It does. So that, that can be part of the challenge when, when you're changing form or you feel like you need, and we will change form. I know a lot of coaches won't uh, change form when a player gets to the college level, but sometimes, uh, you know, players are making slight mistakes with their arm that are getting the ball to go, you know, left or right, where if you could just help them a little bit, uh, they could straighten it out and ultimately become a better shooter. So we will, uh, work with players to get better form and have a more consistent release. Uh, but as you said, when it's something new to them, the first thing that enters their body is tension. So to get them, it's hard for players, no matter how many times you tell them, I don't care if you make any right now, the success is if we can be relaxed and get our hands where we want them at the end of the shot. And we're not going to even be successful with all of that right now, let alone make it but we have to define success in a different way. And then we'll get to whether the ball goes in the basket more than it used to. And it's easy to say, but it's a lot harder for a player uh, to accept because, you know, a lot of being a good basketball players, how often do I make it? And now I'm working on something and I might have to take one step backwards before I can take a giant leap forward. And it's just hard emotionally and mentally for a, a lot of players to, uh, go through that struggle of just, you know, being embarrassed because they're missing more. So uh, that's where you have to develop the trust with your players. Uh, for us, I think the fact that uh, so many of our players have done it and then been really successful gives them you know, the, the next players uh, a better feeling about, okay, I'm willing to try this and not be so self-conscious about it. Yeah, it's such a great point that they have players ahead of them that have gone through the same thing and now can validate that it's worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. The other thing is that you said, which is like giving up a known for a potentially better unknown is such a challenge. And that's really at the art of coaching, isn't it? To be able to get them to do that. Yeah, I think for whatever you, you uh, teach them or asking them to change, you try to, hey, this is going to ultimately be what it looks like, and this is how it's going to help you. And, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's changing their shot or, you know, changing the way they catch the ball or changing the way they run in transition, if they can start to see some benefits or understand, like, you know, use video of former players who, uh, are, you know, do it the way they, you want it done so they can model that behavior and you can say, you know, this player just changed the way they ran in conversion. And because of that, you know, they were able to create four or six more points a game or, uh, you know, two more scoring opportunities for the point guard or whatever it is. And if they can see it and then model it uh, and then you hope have early success with it, because that always uh, changes the motivation when they can see, um, you know, if you're asking them to shot fake and, you know, their first three shot fakes are at the wrong time and you're telling them, no, that's not when you do it and stuff. And a lot of times they'll say, well, then I don't want to do it. If they can shot fake and then touch the pain and then get an assist because somebody else had to help, all of a sudden they'll look for the next opportunity themselves for when they can utilize that move again. So uh, I think early success and then showing them someone a model who's had success with it, uh, whether it be a WNBA player or NBA player too, those are things that a lot of our players look up to those players. So if they can see, you know, this is a similar move to what this person's doing and you can see them having success with it. And I can see you being able to do this, some of the same things, I think, Everybody wants to hear that. Oh, I can do the same things as this professional player. And I'm like, yeah, you can. Uh, but, you know, keeping them motivated when there's not immediate success is always a bigger challenge. Yeah. And uh, can you, I want you to just maybe clarify. So we talked about the importance of the release. What, what are you saying with the offhand then? You want it finishing out the rim as well? Well, the offhand, we want off the ball. Uh, before the ball is actually released by the shooting hand. Um, 
but we don't want to, what we don't like is we don't like it being really pulled off far to the side. Like we don't want it to do anything to affect the shooting hand, even an inch or two. So, you know, some players are really let that guide hand fly off and affect, you know, the, the other arm or the release of the ball. Uh, so we like to keep both hands within the target on the release. Now I know some players put in so much time and effort and they just, you know, drop that balance hand or guide hand, whatever you want to call it right away. And, uh, but for players that maybe aren't at that point yet, keeping everything, the ball as stable as possible, keeping the body from, uh, leaning one way or the other, or getting pulled in one direction or the other just helps keeping the ball on that straight line. Uh, awesome insights into shooting and, uh, let's go back to where it all starts on offense. And that starts with transition because that's another part that uh, obviously is a big emphasis in your program. So I'm curious about your transition system. Then do you have des designated spots? Do you have players that have to go to certain spots and numbered or what's the philosophy with transition? Well, we don't have any numbers. Uh, and I would say, you know, we have, we run a very basic transition. It's really about how quickly can you get it down the floor and then what decisions do you make? It's, it's like anything else. It, uh, there's some effort for flip, we call it flipping the numbers. You know, we want to pass people if we can, uh, but it really comes down to, can you make the right decision at the speed you're playing? And we want to play fast and make good decisions. First thing, you know, we want to get the ball out quick, uh, whether it be an outlet, uh, whether it be our guards rebounding. Uh, sometimes our five player can handle it and lead the break. Uh, so whoever is capable of leading the break and getting the ball and getting us going, uh, then like most teams, we want the corners filled with players who are down and ready. Uh, and then other players fill the sideline. Uh, we create maximum space and conversion, and then we read the defense. If the defense is jamming up the paint, we're not attacking the paint. We're, we're moving the ball and flowing right into offense. If, you know, they're spread out, taking away our three-point shooters, and we have a chance to attack the paint. We'll try to attack the paint under control or maybe even get all the way to the rim. So it really is super simple. I mean, it, there's nothing complicated about it. Like, we get the ball, we run as hard as we can, and we look to see how we're being guarded and, and hopefully make the right decision based on – you know, the defenders will tell us what to do. If they give us space to attack, we'll attack it. If not, we'll move the ball and we'll start seeing if you've got everybody matched up. You know, for us, it's, you know, attack the space or find your numbers advantage. And, you know, if there's a two-on-one, can we get the ball to the two-on-one and make a good decision with it? So it's not a – there's no numbers. Uh, the concepts are – really, really simple. And, uh, it all depends on our, our players ability to make decisions, but we spend time on film and we spend time in practice every day talking about, you know, we'll go up and down and then we'll say, all right, which side was your two on one? Now, which side did you pass it to? Those are the situations that we're asking you to be able to read so that we don't waste a good scoring opportunity. And there's few things better than having a numbers advantage. And then hopefully, you know, instead of making a mistake 50% of the time, they eventually make a mistake 10% of the time. And then you're going to get better shots and conversion because of it. So you talked about uh, shot selection and you've talked about three-point shooting. So in transition, are you finding that you get a certain type of three more often than not? Or is that, again, more team specific, opponent specific relative to how they're defending in transition? But it does depend on how the team defends us. Uh, you know, some teams will send all five people back. Some people will really try to take away the paint. And they'll, you know, have somebody guard the ball and one people guard each elbow. Um, but just like anything else, when you decide to guard it one way, something else becomes a better option. And so can you make the better option? If the paint's jammed up, move the ball. Hopefully it's to a player that, you know, we say, uh, you know, an extra beat for their feet. So like if the point guard had the ball and they saw the wing running, 
They may hold it for an extra second so that our wing can actually have their feet set before they catch it instead of taking a three on the run. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. You just, you read the defense, uh, where aren't they or where are they a man down, pass the ball there. Um, but then keep moving. You know, we don't want our point guard to pass it and then stand there and ask for it back. We want to start the circulation um, of our offense, even in conversion, once we make a pass. So it's never pass and stand or pass and stare. I love the terminology that's shining through circulation for the offense. I think a lot of coaches will adapt that now, coach. Um, talking a little bit you can recruit and you can develop players to get all five players that can shoot the ball talking maybe more to a high school coach who's got a football player that came from football or something like that. What is your philosophy on a non-shooter within your offense, within your system? How do you use them? Well, if you have somebody who doesn't have to be guarded, uh, there's only a few things that you can do. Like you can play them where they have to be guarded, where they're, you know, going to be around the basket or uh, what they call the dunker spot on penetration where they can step up for dump downs. You can use them as a screener, but you can't screen people to the basket because that's where their defender is. So they have to be able to cap in for shooters and create uh, screening opportunities for, you know, shooters at the three point line. Uh, the best thing what we've done is teach those players how to shoot. <laughs> Otherwise, you're always going to be dealing with those situations that are less than ideal. That maybe you can make them work if they become really good screeners or offensive rebounders, especially if their defender is always helping. Um, but I feel like sometimes coaches uh, underestimate the ability to really work with somebody and make them at least have to be respected at the three-point line. Uh, if you think about it, if they're completely unguarded, they can have their feet set. You can, you know, penetrate a little bit, do an inside out three. If they can make three out of 10 threes completely unguarded by themselves, it's still pretty efficient, especially if you can get one offensive rebound in that situation on those, you know, seven misses, even if they make two out of 10 and you're able to get an offensive rebound for a score, it's something that you can live with. And, you know, I've, we've not guarded people a lot of times and it's usually bit us. Like it's somebody that doesn't shoot many threes that we dare them to shoot. And then they go, you know, three for six because they were completely unguarded. Um, if somebody can't shoot that well, it's a lot different than not having to be on the move, having to come off the screen. I can see them not being able to shoot at a good enough level to be able to do that. But when it's completely unguarded, they can get their feet set. They have as much space as they want. Uh, hopefully you can develop those players where they can at least make three out of 10 completely unguarded. I'm glad you brought up offensive rebounding too, because that's, that's another advantage of shooting a lot of threes, isn't it? That there's a lot of rebounds in space for your players to compete for. Can you talk about your philosophy there? Well, I mean, that's evolving. Like we've never been a really good offensive rebounding team. We've taken the, uh, we, we've had special players who had really good offensive rebounding abilities. So we would let them go and, you know, they would kind of keep us competitive in, in possessions on offensive rebounds. We usually dominate possessions by dominating the turnover battle more than the offensive rebound battle. We try to uh, limit other teams' offensive rebounds, and then we try to dominate transition points by uh, making sure that other teams have to run their sets against us rather than score and conversion against us. Um, but I think if you have players that are really talented at beating blockouts and, and getting second shots, you, you might be doing a disservice not letting them attack the boards more. Uh, one time, the times we attack the boards the most are actually against a zone defense. We attack the backside a lot uh, and have had a lot of success against that. So, you know, I'm always 
evolving and wondering, okay, how many people can we send where it's still going to be a, a positive trade-off for us uh, in relation to how many points in conversion we give up? Uh, and I'm not sure I know the exact number, but I think this year we have some kids that are pretty good at getting offensive rebounds. So there might be an opportunity to, to send more people to the boards than maybe we have in the past. You mentioned the turnover battle. Can you expand on that a little bit? And particularly, we haven't talked much about defense, but how that influences what you do defensively. Yeah, well, we're not, uh, we don't do a lot of trapping or a lot of pressing or a lot of gambling, but uh, you know, we were aggressive in terms of we're not going to let you make bad passes and the ball get there. You know, we're trying to force turnovers, get deflections, uh, maintain gap integrity, but have good vision of the ball and being able to act on the ball quickly. Uh, the more turnovers we can force leads us to our transition game and easy baskets. So uh, we do emphasize forcing of turnovers and because we emphasize forcing of turnovers and we practice against each other it forces us to be a little bit better with the ball and to reduce our number of turnovers and then really everything is just reversed all the shots that we want to create on offense are the ones we want to take away defensively and uh, that makes for a competitive practice environment you know we shouldn't be getting a lot of catch and shoot threes in practice if our defense is doing everything it's supposed to and uh our offense should, you know, they've got to have the mindset that they're still going to be able to create these shots, no matter how good the defense is. So, uh, you know, understanding what each side of the ball wants to get done and still be able to uh, create the shots that you want on offense and eliminate the shots you want on defense and let your players go at it and see which side was better today. The other thing I've heard is that you use basically a really simple scouting report for your players. Uh, which I've always agreed with as well, where it's it's a one pager or something like that, that simple. Can you talk about that? Yeah, we spent a lot of time on scouting, uh, but you know, a lot of people put together like a 15 page scouting report. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of details that I'm not sure affect how you would guard somebody. If you say somebody's like an average shooter and an average driver and they're okay on offensive rebounder, I'm not sure knowing that information changes how anybody would guard anybody. So we try to focus things that we could fit on one page or a page and a half with the most important information for us to be successful in that game. And that involves knowing, Hey, how do their best players like to score? Uh, what is this team really good at? What do they try to hurt you with? What are the most important concepts for us to focus on this game to win? And if there's, uh, 50 concepts that we need to focus on to win, we're probably not going to. Win. Um, so we try to make it, you know, the five or six most important points, uh, the five or six most important things we have to know about their personnel. And, and if we kind of keep the game plan simple like that, and everybody really knows it, we have a chance to execute it. Um, so that's just always been our philosophy. You know, we type up a page, page and a half, but we want our players to know that inside and out. And then when we play, we want it to look like they, the fact that they went over film and the game plan written out, we can see that on the court when we play. So the other unique thing is that, uh, I mean, you've had, you have a really good coaching tree. Nikki Colleen has been on here, uh, now the new Baylor coach, um, Chelsea Banbury, a bunch, bunch of coaches that have gone. Keith Freeman, a really good friend of both of ours, who is a big fan of yours and everything else. But one of the things I noticed is that you have this, which I think is awesome, that you hire a lot of your former players as assistants. Can you talk about that philosophy as well? Well, uh, that's something that we've developed here. Uh, you know, we started the program from scratch 20 years ago. Uh, and as time went on, you know, I, I know how hard it is to get into the coaching profession. There's so many people that want to get in. And I've just always uh, wanted to give our former players an opportunity if possible. Uh, you know, a lot of our players, they come in, they have no intentions of coaching. Uh, 
Um, and we really try to teach them the game rather than a bunch of plays. And a lot of them, you know, feel c- comfortable at that point that they know the game well enough to become a coach. And to me, I'm, I'm proud of that. And uh, when you hire, you know, your former players, a lot, one, they know your style, your terminology. They know things kind of inside out. Um, so you already have that connection. Two, you know them better than you're going to know anybody from just an interview process. So I already know their work ethic and their character and uh, how they relate to people. Uh, and three, they, the program is important to them. So when they are talk about the program or uh, tell other people about the program, it's sincere when they talk about how it's a special place and what they learned here and uh, how it could help, um, you know, recruits or whoever it is down the road. So, uh, and, you know, all recruits now talk about wanting that family atmosphere. I think for us, it's something where when you hire from within your program and your players, there's kind of automatically that family atmosphere because you've already worked together and, 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 been in those battles those games for so many times that you have that family atmosphere uh immediately uh in that connection immediately so uh, one of the things i'm you know most proud of and usually when i watch games it's a you know one of my former uh, assistants and to see them be so successful that's something that i get a lot of joy in um and that you know they stay in contact all these years later still have questions when something comes up um you know that's just something that's been really exciting and you know I have some assistants now that are just amazing coaches who are going to be amazing head coaches and I'm looking forward to the day where they're running their program and having similar success to our former assistants who are coaching now that's great fun great fun Coach, this has been awesome. It's been it's been a lot of fun to be able to shed some light on some of the reasons why you've been successful. And uh, I'm just curious in wrapping up if there's any other advice you have for coaches about uh, you know some of the things that have helped you be successful. Well, for me, I wasn't a college basketball player, um, and when I played in high school, I had a different coach every year. Uh, so I wasn't. I didn't believe one way was the only way that you could play. Uh, I wasn't committed to anything. I just wanted to learn. And I went to a lot of clinics and read a lot of books and then kind of for myself decided if things made sense. And, uh, you know, I read uh, Nick Nurse's book and he had a, a segment in there where he said that he was in a basement with somebody and they drew up plays and did all this stuff for like months at a time. Uh, and then people would ask him like, well, what all did you learn? Share it with me. And he was like, no, that's not the point of it. And for me, I I think it's kind of the same thing is when I got started, I, I didn't know how good a coach I could be. I was uh, nervous. So I was studying film all the time and just spending, you know, ridiculous hours. I remember when I was at Walsh and IPFW, I had an assistant who's the head coach now at OU, Ohio U, uh, Bob Bolden. And we would watch you know, one game, we'd spend 10 hours on the film, breaking down every little thing about the game. And I think uh, being afraid that I wasn't good enough forced me to work hard and uh, just learn the game on my own by just watching as much film as I can and try to analyze it and figure out why things were working and why things weren't working. And, uh, you know, I would just encourage anybody who's trying to get into this field, you know, hopefully you're getting into it for the right reasons to help players, but also that you're just uh, inquisitive and you want to learn and you don't take anybody's word as uh, being the end all that you're willing to try new things. And uh, if you see how much the game has changed over the last 15 years, you know, anything that you would have heard as being absolute basketball 15 to 20 years ago is just the opposite now. So, being willing to come up with your own ideas and advance the game any way that you can. Incredible stuff, coach. Thank you so much for sharing the game with us. Well, thank you for having me.